Good morning and welcome to the January 2017 monthly webinar for LEA Special Education Points of Contact. My name is Annette Becker Bartlett. I am with the Aussie Division of Elementary, Secondary, and Specialized Education. And I'm joined today by members of the Aussie assessment team, Ms. Cassie Lenat. Today's topic focuses specifically on testing accommodations for students with disabilities. So we, it's a joint effort between the assessment team and the elementary, secondary, and specialized education team. If you have not already, there is a handout available for download through your menu bar with GoToWebinar. It's a PDF copy of today's slides. Now, before we get started, I'd like to know who is in my audience. So if you could please take a moment to answer the poll question. Love to know how many of you are experienced POCs versus new POCs, or perhaps you are supporting. I should have added a category today for LEA test coordinator or test administrator, as I know a lot of testing administrators are attending uh, just for today because it talks a lot about assessment items. All right, thank you everyone for voting. And here you can see we have a variety of people attending today. Great, thank you. This training today is a part of a series of assessment trainings to get you ready for um, the upcoming Park Science, MSAA, Health, NAEP, Access, all of the above. We just have all kinds of all kinds of assessments, and I want to hopefully touch on we'll touch on all of those today to make sure you are aware of the accommodations available. On January 3rd, there was an introduction to 2017 accommodations webinar delivered by the Aussie assessment team, and that link will take you to the recording and a copy of the slides. Today's webinar focuses on assessment accommodations for students with disabilities, and the recording will be posted hopefully within one or two business days of today. And for English learner accommodations, there are actually not enough changes for this year to merit another training. So we are referring you to the webinar recording from last year that discussed um, accommodations for English learners. And there is an upcoming training that's actually an in-person training, not a webinar. And this will conclude our series of trainings for students with disabilities and assessments. It will be on February 6th from 3 to 5 p.m. That will be hosted by the Aussie assessment team, and it will focus specifically on park student registration and personal needs profiles. Today we're going to do an overview very quickly of accommodations and accessibility features, and then we're going to talk about those features in SEDS, how you would document those. We will touch on unique accommodations, alternate assessment accommodations, NAEP accommodations, resources, and then we will have a few reminders about the Aussie support tool and a few other announcements and reminders. Let's start with an overview. This table shows all of the assessments that are happening this year. A lot of these should look familiar as they were administered last year as well. So we'll just keep it moving this year. There's not any big changes to the type of statewide assessments that we are administering. But this table is here just for your reference if you happen to be new to DC. The assessment schedule for this spring is shown here. The first test coming up is the NAEP assessment, which I will talk about later in the webinar. And then we have the WIDA access assessment for English learners. The alternate assessment window opens up at the end of March, and it's quite a long window. And then there is the health assessment. And I will make a note that the health assessment is not actually part of our uh, set of statewide assessments. Rather, it's a separate assessment administered by our Division of Health and Wellness. Um, but I will talk to you today about the accommodations for students with disabilities available for that health assessment. The park windows, there are two to choose from. Those of you that uh, are test coordinators or test administrators, um, you're already well aware of these windows. 
um, but just wanted to remind you here so for planning purposes. Accommodations for special populations fall into four distinct categories. You have your students with IEPs, your students with disabilities that instead of an IEP, they have a Section 504 plan, then you have students who are English learners, and then you have a smaller set of students that are dual identified, meaning they have a disability and they are an English learner. And in that case, they qualify for both sets of accommodations. Otherwise, the other students that are not dual identified, it will be a separate menu of accommodations for disabilities versus English learners. Last year, Aussie put together a comprehen comprehensive testing accommodations manual <coughs> that talked about each accommodation available for, for you to document on a student's IEP. And then it crosswalked those accommodations from what you see in SED's Easy IEP to what it's called on each statewide assessment. Now, in a perfect world, every single statewide assessment would use the exact same terminology and offer the exact same accommodations, but as you know, it can vary from test to test for what types of accommodations are available. Therefore, um, we have to crosswalk to each test from what you select on the IEP. But of course, when you select the accommodations on the IEP, you are thinking about an accommodation a student would possibly need across all assessments. This manual, although it was published last year, is still relevant for this year. There have only been very minor changes in some of the accommodations available or perhaps the name of an accommodation. I will review those minor changes with you later in the webinar. And the website link you see at the bottom of the page takes you to our testing accommodation site, which has a lot of resources uh, from last year, and it's where we're going to post all of our resources for this year. It also links to the park manual, um, so that is a good go-to website for you to get more information in general about accommodations for students with disabilities. Park specifically has their own giant manual for accessibility features and accommodations. Um, they update it every fall, so currently the fifth edition is the most current, and it goes very in-depth on each and every accommodation and accessibility feature available on the park assessment, how to administer it, how to determine who's eligible, what to do to prepare in advance, what to do on the day of testing, after testing, for each and every feature. So this is also linked to our Aussie Testing Accommodations webpage for your reference. Now we've taken information from this manual and make sure that we, and we have crosswalked it to what we name each accommodation available in SEDS for students' IEPs. And I did forget to mention, if you have questions at any time, please type them in the question or chat box and we'll do our best to answer those questions as we go along. And if we can't answer them as we go along, we'll stay afterwards for a few minutes or follow up with you by email at a later date. So definitely we encourage questions throughout the webinar today. The park accessibility system um, is very specific in how they, call, how they name certain features and who qualifies for certain features. Uh, this structure can also be generally applied when you think about other statewide assessments, such as the DC Science Assessment. Accessibility features that are, are accessibility features are actually still accommodations, but they are available to more than just students with disabilities. They are actually available to all students, and so that's why they have a different name. Now, the park testing platform, because it's a technological platform, there are certain features that have to be identified in advance um, versus certain features that are just automatically built into the system. And I will show you some examples of each of these on the next slide. But just so you know, the uh, purple and the blue circles, those, those are all considered accessibility features that um, even students without dis disabilities could qualify for. However, we have seen 
in the last few years of testing, we have seen LEAs and schools that have assigned these accessibility features in a blanket wholesale manner to all of their students or large groups of students, but that is not appropriate to do so. For example, um, having a math assessment that read aloud or the um, text to speech or other read aloud features on the math assessment. Technically that is available to any student not just students with disabilities. However, it should not be assigned in a blanket manner to all students. You still need to consider on the individual student level whether, whether or not that student needs to have the math test read aloud to him or her in order to access the test. Uh, most students do not need that, and in fact, it can impede some students from being able to concentrate and do their best on the math test. So. Um, Asi will be um, watching out for that this year of any uh, large groups of students that are given accessibility features in a, in a, in a blanket manner um, instead of considering more at an individual level. And then we have accommodations which, which are only for the students with disabilities or English learners. And those have to be specifically documented in the IEP 504 plan or the English Learner plan. Now here are some examples. So some of the accessibility features that are automatically built into the test that you do not have to set anything up in advance for are things like the pop-up glossary, spell check, line reader tool, repetition of directions. Then there are features that you have to identify in advance because the testing platform has to be set up in a certain way. Here are examples of that. Now I will note that some accessibility features are actually called administrative considerations because those are the type of features that are not built into the testing platform, rather those are things that testing coordinators figure out um, ahead of time if a student needs them, such as taking breaks or small group testing. Um, those have to be worked out and planned for and documented um, outside of the testing platform is how you would take care of those. And then certain examples for students with disabilities would be a human signer or a calculation device, screen reader, and for an English learner, things like a word-to-word -word dictionary or translation of the math assessment. So here you can see the differences in the type of feature. Now I will remind you that a student with a disability, if they need one of the features that PARC likes to call an accessibility feature, it is still considered an accommodation for that student with a disability because you need to denote it on the IEP as an official accommodation. And that's because not all assessments call that feature an accessibility feature. Another assessment might limit it to just students with disabilities, and so you need to make sure that it's documented on the IEP because that says the student has a right to have that feature available on any assessment, whether or not it's called an accessibility feature or an administrative consideration or an accommodation or a universal design feature. Okay, here are the updates for the school year that affect what you will see when you go to register with the personal needs profile and when you go look at the crosswalk and what you, when you select things in SEDS. Now, nothing in SEDS Easy IEP has been changed. The last time we updated SEDS to match testing accommodations was August of 2015. So nothing has changed in SEDS. All of the selections on your students' current IEPs, um, none of them need to be edited or fixed or amended unless separately you are deciding they you need to add or remove an accommodation for that student. There has just been some changes in the title of certain accommodations or 
a merger. So for example, general masking and line reader last year were considered two separate tools on the park assessment. This year, park has squished them together and called them a line reader mask tool. So they're just having fun with words here. So, but that's, you don't need to freak out. What this means is now in SEDS, you can either select masking tool or markup tool Either one will count for that student being able to have the park feature of line reader mask tool. Another change is that the feature of the student reading the assessment aloud to themselves is now, <clears throat> excuse me, now considered an accessibility feature, meaning that other students, you could, you could decide that another student that does not have an IEP might actually need this feature as well. But for your students with disabilities, you still think of it as an accommodation because another assessment might still call it an accommodation. So please remember to document, even though PARC now calls it an accessibility feature. Now the PARC manual has a lot of appendices and one of the appendices talks in depth about read aloud guidance. As you know, um, as you know, the District of Columbia several, several, uh, several years ago um, had a history of over-prescribing this accommodation to students inappropriately. It's actually a very particular type of student that qualifies to have the English, langu English language arts park assessment read aloud. Now for the math assessment, read aloud is considered an accessibility feature. Again, you should not prescribe it for all students, but only for those students who truly need it. But for the ELA assessment, it's definitely an accommodation intended only for a very small set of students. So Appendix D in the PARC manual can provide a lot of guidance on exactly who qualifies and who does not qualify for the read aloud accommodation. Now, when I say read aloud, it could look a lot of different ways on the actual assessment. It could be text-to-speech, ASL video, human reader, or human signer. Those all fall under the accommodation of read aloud. The DC Science Assessment, although it is the same assessment as last year, we are currently, um, are, we're currently working on updating the platform to try to make it more similar to the PARC platform and registration system. So they are, it is the same platform of the Pearson Access Next and Test Nav 8 for registration and for administering the test. Um, but there still are some science accommodations that do not yet have the high tech version like PARC does. So for example, screen reader, um, the ASL video, or the speech to text are not yet available in those high tech options but there's definitely a more low-tech option that is equivalent. So here are some examples. However, the good news is that Aussie is currently working with the test vendor to see if they can update some of those low-tech options to be more high-tech options. And then, and then that will make it so the science assessment um, is parallel to what is available for the park mathematics assessment. Now, these updates are tentative. I'll say that again, these are tentative. We do not yet have confirmation which of these high-tech options will be available for the science assessment for this year, but we will definitely let you know as soon as the decisions are finalized. And a lot of it depends on the amount of time it will take to build this out in the platform. Um, we just might not have enough time for this year, and so it would be considered for next year. So here are some examples of things that might change We'll keep you posted. The Access 2.0 assessment for English learners also has accommodations available for students with disabilities. So this is specifically for that small group of students that are dual identified, where they have both a disability and they are an English learner. And so they, of course, are entitled to have accommodations on all assessments, including 
the excess. There is an entire guidance manual um, within it. There's a table. I've shown you a picture here of part of that table that can help you figure out which accommodations would be appropriate for which students with disabilities on this particular test. The health assessment is administered by the Aussie Division of Health and Wellness. So if you have any questions about the health assessment, uh, you should not email the Aussie assessment team. Rather, you should email the school health team. And of course, there are accommodations available in the health assessment for students with disabilities. Now, the health team has done their best to take all of the accommodations that are listed in SEDS, Easy IEP, which you can see on the left-hand column, and line them up with what is available on the health assessment. Sometimes it's named exactly the same. Sometimes it's called something a little bit differently, but they have provided this crosswalk for you to make it very easy to determine what accommodation a student will get on the health assessment based on what you have selected in the IEP as an accommodation for all assessments. And here is another snapshot of that list where you can see on the left what it's called in SEDS, Easy IEP, and on the right what it's called for the health assessment according to the guidelines and manual for administering the health assessment. And you can access this manual at the link I've provided at the bottom of the slide. And again, going back to this slide, if you have questions, email the school health team about this particular assessment um, and they do have a particular way they want you to report to them the assessments uh, the accommodations a student would need for this assessment because it doesn't have that same online registration system that you would see for the science for the park and all of that is explained in their manual okay now let's talk briefly about documenting assessment accommodations in the IEP When you are developing a student's IEP, or when you're amending their IEP for accommodations, um, this feature was added in August 2015, where you separately choose classroom accommodations from statewide assessment accommodations. And we put that in there just to allow you more flexibility in choosing what is needed for a student in these two different environments. There are four types of accommodations in Easy IEP, even though in the um, park manual they lump them into three different types. But in SEDS, it's four different types. We have the response accommodations, timing and scheduling, setting, and presentation. And for those of you that work a lot in SEDS or who assist in developing IEPs or overseeing IEP teams using SEDS, these sound very familiar to you because these are the types of accommodations that have been available uh, for several years. And as I mentioned, PARC uses three of these because they um, sort of merge together. They, they consider some of those setting accommodations as administrative considerations. They don't view them as accommodations because they are available to everyone doesn't mean you should give them to everyone, but they are available to everyone, including students that don't have disabilities. But for your students with IEPs, you have to still consider them accommodations because other assessments might still consider them accommodations. There is a crosswalk that we developed uh, last year that crosswalks what is in SEDS what, it's, what the accommodation is specifically titled in SEDS and what it is specifically titled on the park assessment and the science assessment. Now you can see here the very last column is for the new science assessment in 2017. However, this column still needs to be updated because as I mentioned, Aussie is still working with the vendor to see which features can be changed to a more high-tech option. 
So when you are using the crosswalk that's currently available online is the one from last year. Um, and most of it is still the same. But just know that the science accommodations may be updated. We would never take away an accommodation. We would either enhance it to be more high tech or keep that accommodation and then add another option of a high tech accommodation. So the students, what's available to them is not going to be reduced. It just might be enhanced. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, you can continue to use last year's SEDS Crosswalk to assist you in registration and personal needs profile for each student. Now let's talk about documenting. Students with disabilities either have an IEP or a 504 plan. Depending on which plan you have, it doesn't matter. Either way, you have to document those accommodations in a finalized plan. 504 plans are not done in the SEDS Easy IEP database. Rather, they are done according to each LEA's own 504 process, and you should have your own templates for building the 504 plans that you keep records of. Then the test coordinator is aware of those accommodations for Joey and Sally and makes sure make sure that they are put into the student registration system, which includes the personal needs profile. And if you would like to be trained on that, of course, there's the February 6th training that I mentioned earlier in the webinar. And the last step, of course, is to make sure you account for these accommodations in your school test plan. So for example, a small group, small group testing or a read aloud, there's a lot of accommodations that mean the student needs to be in a different setting so that they can have that accommodation without disturbing other students. So first you put it in their plan, the 504 IEP, then you register them appropriately, then you include it in the school test plan. So all three of these need to be covered. I know it's a lot of work, but it's only January, we got plenty of time, and our OSSEA assessment team is standing by to help you with any of this. Okay. Let's say that Joey's IEP was finalized last August. So it has not yet been a year, so there's no need to update the IEP with an annual IEP meeting. However, in February, the team determines that he actually needs, he actually qualifies for one more accommodation that's not in his current IEP. So of course, you need to do an amendment. Now the amendment does not have to be complicated. As you hopefully know, there are two ways to do an IEP amendment. You can have a meeting or you cannot have a meeting. So if you have a meeting, that's where you get together, talk about it, do the paperwork. But instead of a meeting, in SEDS, you fill in the information, print it out, send it to the parent, parent looks at it, signs off on it, sends it back, and then you can go ahead and finalize that amendment in SEDS without having a meeting. Just make sure you fill out the right paperwork in sets for that. So if you're doing something simple, like just adding another accommodation, you should not have to have a meeting for that purpose. You can have a meeting if you want, but you don't have to for something simple like adding or removing an accommodation for assessments. Let's say Joey had his IEP meeting at the end of March and it's getting very close to testing season and he just so happened to have new accommodations added to his new IEP. However, the school already registered everybody, they already filled out his personal needs profile and now you're making changes. What do you do? Well, you need to go back and update the student registration file and the personal needs profile to make sure you capture those new accommodations. And if your school has already done their proctor caching, they're gonna have to recache because some of Joey's changes might be built into the online platform and need to be turned on in advance. So keep that in mind. Now, there's no problem with adding an accommodation at the last minute. If a student qualifies for an accommodation, he has a right to have that accommodation and you need to make it happen. 
However, as you can see, it's extra work if you add that accommodation at the last minute. So to the best of your ability, you should plan ahead and think now in January about if there's students that are going to need changes to their accommodations as documented in their IEP. Okay, unique accommodations requests. This means it is a request for an accommodation that is not listed in SEDS Easy IEP because the ones in SEDS are the standard list of accommodations that OSSI has approved for use in the District of Columbia for students who are eligible. If it's anything else, you have to get permission from OSSI to be able to use that accommodation because OSSI has to consider whether or not it compromises the integrity and validity of the test. So if there is a need for a unique accommodation because of the student's disabilities and certain circumstances, um, by all means, please um, go ahead and move forward with documenting that accommodation in the IEP and you would use the unique accommodations box within SEDS. There's a little text field where you can type that in, um, but then you need, you're going to need to fill out an additional form, which I will show you a snapshot of. Now, OSSI does not have its own unique accommodations request form. Uh, we may develop one in the future, but for the present time, what OSSI has decided is that we will accept the park unique accommodations form and consider that request to be not just for PARC, but for any other statewide assessments um, that you list on the form. So again, we currently utilize this official PARC form, but consider it for all statewide assessments. So if you need a unique accommodation for the science assessment or the alternate assessment, you would still use this PARC form and make do with this PARC form and we will consider it for other assessments. And once you fill out the form, because it has very sensitive student information, you cannot email us the form. You need to submit the form through a secure data transfer tool. And the Aussie support tool is, your, is the tool that we ask you to use for that. And I'll show you how to submit that in just a second. And after you submit it, the Aussie assessment team reviews the request and lets you know whether or not that accommodation would be acceptable. So the form, on the PARC form, it asks for some information. And again, as I mentioned, we allow this form for other assessments, not just PARC. So in the box I have highlighted here, list the assessments, all the assessments for which the unique accommodation needs to be applied. And then, of course, provide evidence as to why the student truly needs this accommodation. Then you'll take the form and upload it in the Aussie support tool. Now, uh, LEA special ed POCs um, and test coordinators both should have access to the Aussie support tool because it's used for said stuff, but it's also used for assessment support. So either one of you can upload this, uh, type in the student's personal information and attach the form. And at this time, there is not a specific category for unique accommodations. Um, we may build that in if we're able to. So for now, please choose the assessments other category as the issue type. That will allow the people checking the OSSI support tool to quickly route it to the right person on the assessment team. Okay, alternate assessments. The MSAA, um, this is we had the same assessment last year, so this is the second year providing this assessment. It is in an online system. There are a lot of features already built into the online system that can help your students with disabilities access the assessment more easily. And then there are other features that are provided by the test administrator. And then, so some of the features, and then other features are available through the browser, and then some are actually embedded in the design of the test. So there's all different types of features. So I definitely encourage you to become familiar with these features ahead of time before you give the assessment to think about which features a student needs 
and make sure they're documented in their IEP and to make sure you know how to administer those accommodations if there's anything tricky with either the technology or putting the student in a certain setting. And here is a table that summarizes those features available. Some are embedded in the test platform, some are provided by the test administrator, and some are part of the operating system. And there are several that actually need to be documented in the IEP, um, and it's pretty straightforward how to do that. Now for the science assessment, it still remains as a portfolio. So it is not an actual assessment, so you do not need to think about assessment accommodations. Now let's talk about NAEP. The NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, this year is a NAEP testing year. There, uh, the window actually starts at the end of this month, so it's coming up pretty quick. So if you oversee students that are participating in this assessment, it's not every student, but it, uh, you know who you are if you're taking the NAEP, and make sure your students with disabilities have access to the accommodations that they qualify for. There are accommodations available for those students um, because NAEP has an inclusion philosophy. They want all students to be able to access the NAEP test and do their best. Here you can find a link to the NAEP inclusion policy as well as the Aussie NAEP resource page. But in particular, if you want to see a list of accommodations available on NAEP, there is a link to that resource which is found on Aussie's NAEP resource site. But there's also a training that was recorded I think about a month ago and posted on the Aussie website, the NAEP assessment specialist on the Aussie team um, delivered a training on exactly what those universal design and accommodations features are for the NAEP and they go more in depth on those. So I will refer you to that recording. Also on that page is a copy of the slide deck if you don't want to listen to the whole recording. Um, but I definitely encourage you to work together with your NAEP school coordinator and make sure these features are available for students with disabilities and documented appropriately. Okay, resources for you. Again, there is the Aussie Testing Accommodations Manual that we already talked about earlier in the webinar. Just wanna remind you of where to find it. And then for the park assessment, there are tons and tons of resources available. You've got practice tutorials, you've got your manual, you have training modules, you've got a lot of stuff. Um, and the manual goes very in depth about what to do before, during, and after testing for every single one of the accommodations available and accessibility features. So you can really dig into that manual if you wanna see more details on that. And of course, you can practice. We definitely encourage you to practice using the computer testing platform so that it's not new to the student. And there are videos and practice questions, all sorts of fun stuff. There are um, just all kinds of resources. There's mini modules that are um, just a few minutes long, so it's very easy to watch, doesn't take up a lot of time. And there are interactive models to practice the accessibility features and accommodations. So again, this is all found through the Pearson site. Um, this is, you can go um, look at the user interface. I know our assessment team has been sending out uh, weekly bulletins to test coordinators with a lot of this information, but I just wanna make the LEA special ed POCs also aware that there's lots of ways to plan ahead and prepare for giving your students the accommodations and helping them be very comfortable with using that accommodation in the online platform before the test happens. Because what we've seen in the past is students with disabilities have been assigned a number of accommodations, but when it comes 
to the day of testing, they don't use them. And that's because one of the reasons why is because they don't know how to use that feature in the online assessment. So please, please practice with those students how to use that accommodation feature so that they are comfortable with it and can use it appropriately on testing day. And here are some additional guidelines available for transcription. And again, I want to remind you that there is a training coming up on February 6th, and this training will focus on student registration and personal needs profile. It's an in-person training, and you can sign up using this link. Please sign up in advance so we make sure that we have a seat for you. And our assessment team will be delivering this webinar, and it follows naturally after this training now that we've talked about the accommodations. Okay. For those of you that are LEA special education points of contact, we have some reminders for you. If you have lots of students experiencing the same issue in SEDS or other data systems, please do not submit a bunch of different tickets if it's the same issue. Rather, we have a global issues template that you should download, fill it out, and submit it under one ticket. And this is going to save you time, and it's going to save Aussie time, and it's going to help us be more organized. So please use that. Don't submit a separate ticket for every student if it's the same issue. You can find that template under the quick reference guides. Now the type of category you choose. There are literally hundreds of people submitting tickets to the Aussie support tool every single day. And our, um, our team that uses the Aussie, that looks at the Aussie support tool as those tickets are coming in, they're getting hundreds of tickets and they want to route them to the appropriate person as quickly as they can so that you can get an answer as quickly as you can. And when you choose the other category, it slows down that process because the uh, routing team has to dig a lot deeper and try to guess at which which person it should be routed to. So please, please don't use the other category unless it truly is an other issue. Now we have, I'm gonna turn the time over to Cassie from our assessment team for just one minute. Sure, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be updating some of the titles in the OST um, over the next few weeks. So you may see some changes there, but they should be a little more intuitive. Um, we also have a training on how to use the OST prior to testing on March 6th. So if you're interested in that, we should be announcing um, a registration link in the bulletin closer to the time. Um, but for anyone who's unfamiliar or uncertain about the OST, please feel free to join us or ask questions along the way. Thank you, Cassie. And yes, um, in looking to last year, um, the Aussie support tool this year will be the same as last year and that this is your main way to get assistance from the assessment team um, before and during all of the assessments. Um, the team, again, there's a whole team that checks this tool all throughout the day and they can quickly respond to you. And so you use this for all kinds of different issues with assessments and registration or like issues going on on the day of testing, things like that. Um, but you can also use this. This tool is also widely used by LEA special ed POCs, not just for stuff with assessments, but of anything with SEDS or student records, things like that. So if you are not familiar with how to use this tool, yet you know you're going to be one of the people reaching out to Aussie during testing time, again, watch for that notification of the March 6th training on how to use the OST if you're not already comfortable. And again, back to the other category. Don't choose it unless it really is an other, because that will slow down the process of sending it to the right person. Now, sometimes you don't see the issue on the initial list. That's because the issue is going to pop up under the subcategory. So first you pick the issue and then there's a subcategory that opens up. So one of the big ones that we see a lot for other is when a student is not appearing in SEDS and people choose other because they don't see that listed on the issue type. However, that is an enrollment issue. So you select enrollment and then there's a subcategory menu 
and you can specifically select student not appearing in sets. And this will help the team send it directly to the person that can solve this problem for you. Other examples of issues that should not be put in the other category are here. Again, if you can't see a student in SEDS, that is an enrollment issue. If the student is no longer attending your school, that is an enrollment issue. If one of the attendance data is not feeding correctly into Click, that is a system issue. So anything to do with Click, you would say you would choose system issue, and then you can choose Click as a subcategory. So if you don't see the issue type you want, um, try selecting a few different issue types and see if your issue appears in the subcategory menu. And just a quick reminder, because it's January, sometimes we get a lot of transfers happening between schools. If you have new students at your school and you do not yet see their records in SEDS, please, please, please request that transfer of records. If you see them with a white check mark, but you know that they have an IEP or are currently undergoing evaluation, that means you need to request those SEDS records to come on over. They have not come over if it's a white check mark. You can do that in the Aussie support tool. Now, just a note, if you are a dependent charter LEA and you know who you are, you can't go through Aussie for this. You have to go through DCPS, through their SEDS help desk to resolve that. Okay, and another reminder, you are not non-publics. However, a lot of you have students attending non-publics. And we always get this issue where a non-public staff member will go to your LEA and they will say, hey, I need, I have a new service provider. Can you please create the SEDS account? Just say no. Do not ever create a SEDS account for a non-public staff member. You need to redirect them to Aussie. Aussie is the one that creates the SEDS aggregate account for that non-public staff member. And then once Aussie has set up that account, now the non-public SEDS point of contact comes to you as the LEA SCPOC and says, hey, I have my SEDS account set up for the staff member. Now please give them access to these specific students. And then you go in and provide access to those specific non-public staff members. Okay, a few more announcements as we're wrapping up. Those of you out there that are experienced SEDS gurus or my SEDS ninjas, you know who you are. We are looking for people to give input on a new SEDS interface. And we would love for you to participate in a feedback group. So again, if you are experienced in SEDS, um, and you have a lot to say about it, we would love to have you come be in our feedback group. So please send an email to the data training team and let us know that you'd like to participate. And then we can share with you more details to figure out um, if that's going to work for you. So, and we, we would love to have people of any user type in SEDS. Maybe you have a related service provider that's awesome at SEDS and is always complaining, like, why doesn't it do this? Why doesn't it do that? Send them on over. Um, so we really look forward to getting feedback from actual SEDS users before we make any decisions on a new interface. And of course, we want to remind you that there's always an ongoing calendar of trainings on Aussie data systems. You can learn more about it at this website. This is also the homepage for the data systems training team. And this is where we um, archive all of our monthly webinars, like today's webinar will be archived here for the LEA SCPOCs, in addition to other webinars and trainings that have been given on other data systems. And a special announcement about something very exciting coming up. As you are aware, No Child Left Behind has been left behind and replaced by President Obama with the Every Student Succeeds Act. 
and it's going to be awesome. Um, but you need to know what's going on with that and how to get ready for its rollout next school year. So Aussie is hosting a February LEA Institute that is focused exclusively on ESSA and what you need to do to get ready. Um, and the type of people that we really would like to show up to this are LEA and school leaders. And if you are an LEA special education point of contact, you definitely count as an LEA leader um, because there is a section of ESSA that focuses on students with disabilities and we will have a breakout session on that for you. Um, as well as you can learn in general about the accountability framework. Now, if you don't know this already, ESSA is very state level focused and every state has to come up with a very intense in-depth plan on how they're going to roll out ESSA and have accountability for making sure all their students are learning. And so at this institute, we're going to share, our state superintendent is going to share a lot of information about what is in DC's state plan and how it affects you and um, all the resources we have to support you and you get to take some time um, with your school teams to make sure you're ready for it. So register today, free lunch. And of course we have ongoing trainings available on a variety of topics, special ed topics, and more general um, learning standards, um, behavior, secondary transition, um, English learner trainings, all sorts of things that you can find on the training calendar here. You can also find it on the Aussie events calendar. And just a quick reminder, if you have preschool or pre-K students with disabilities, you probably are well aware that the deadline has passed for child outcome summary entry data. So if you, um, hopefully you're not clueless, hopefully you've already turned it in, um, but this is just a quick reminder if you have not, or if you have outstanding requests from Aussie for more information, please um, get on top of that. And there is an email here at the bottom for any questions you have about us. And that's it, we're at the end. So uh, I'm gonna look to see if we have a couple questions to be answered, let's see. Okay, now before, before we do some more question and answer, I really would like to take a poll question. It's gonna just take one minute. I need some feedback from you. Did you have a positive experience in the training today? So please take a minute to vote. It's as simple as clicking a button. You had a positive experience in this training. Five more seconds to vote. Great, thank you for all of those who voted. Now I would love to know if you feel like this was an effective training for you. Thank you for your votes, and please rate the course content and materials. Course content and materials. Great, thank you, and please rate the overall presentation of the materials by the lovely Annette Thacker Bartlett. And now we have an open-ended question Please let us know the strengths or weaknesses of this presentation. 
Um, we, we love feedback in general about the monthly series for LEA SEPOCs, and we also welcome feedback on today's specific topic and webinar, um, strengths, things you found helpful, ways it can be improved, things you wish we would have talked about, resources that you wish we provided to you besides just this webinar. And an additional open-ended question is, what additional training or professional development do you need to strengthen your practice? And these, for those of you that are test administrators or test coordinators joining us as special guests today, just so you know, these are questions that we ask every month to our LEA special ed POCs to make sure we're giving them the, the support they need. So of course, test coordinators, you're also welcome to give input. And we will share this input with the assessment team. And now feel free to continue to type your suggestions and feedback in the chat box. And at this time, we are going to pause. Um, this is the end of the webinar, so thank you for coming. Um, and at this time, I'm going to pause and read through some of the questions coming in and then um, take a few minutes to see if there's anything to answer out loud. Um, so if you have, it is 11 o'clock. So if you have to leave, that's great. Um, if we didn't answer your question, we'll follow up with you later. Um, and please remember to join us next month. Now, test coordinators, you're off the hook. You don't have to come next month. It doesn't apply. But for LEA SEPOCs, you know who you are. And we will see you on February 15th. The topic will be ESY. And then in March, the topic will be a training, a deeper training on the Related Services Management Report, uh, the new version available in Click that was rolled out in the fall. So stay tuned. Questions about assessments? There's the email. And questions about anything else? There's the other email here. OK, so I'm going to go offline for a minute and look at some of the questions. And then I'll be back. Okay, thanks everyone. All of the questions we see are uh, more individual follow-up questions, so we will follow up with you later, either your assessment team or the SEDS team. Thank you for joining today, and have a lovely weekend and week. <laughs>